If you've ever been a parent or worked with kids, you've found yourself repeating yourself a lot, and we're going to see that from Solomon today in Proverbs chapter 22. Hey guys, and welcome back to God's Word Made Simple by Simple Servant Ministries. My name is Aaron Hawk, and if this is your first time visiting with us, I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. God's Word Made Simple is an online discipleship ministry dedicated to taking God's Word and making it simple. We want to help you understand God's Word, apply it to your life, and grow in your relationship with the Lord. Also, if you appreciate this ministry and content, at some point make sure and hit that subscribe button, turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. We would love to have you as part of our family. Okay guys, welcome back. So we are in Proverbs chapter 22 and we are starting in verse 22. If you didn't catch last week's video, make sure you catch that um, Proverbs 22, 17. So make sure you catch that one because um, that kind of sets up the, the approach that I'm taking to this passage today. Um, so I think this is a section where Solomon is realizing that his son may not be paying a lot of attention. I covered that last time and he's kind of going to repeat some of his top advice here. So I think that's what's going on here in 22. Two. Maybe not. That's just what I'm understanding from this passage, regardless the, the general truths. And remember, Proverbs is a collection of general truths, not absolute truths. Um, but I think either way, the uh, general truths stand. So uh, let's move on to verse 22. I think this is kind of to Solomon's top list here. Do not rob the poor because he is poor. And how often do you see poor people victimized, right? I'll never forget one of the people that taught me in the book of Proverbs many years ago, a guy named Curtis. Um, I'll never forget, he said, on your way home, notice how many businesses are designed to take advantage of people that are down on their luck. And you think about all the pawn shops and the title loan places and just all these different businesses that are designed to take advantage of people that are down on their luck. Now, I'm not saying that the owners of those things are necessarily trying to take advantage. I'm just saying that that's what those businesses end up doing. So I'm not getting into the politics of that. But if you're down on your luck and you need a title loan, I mean, that's to me, that's a predatory loan, right? I mean, the interest on those things is absurd. But if you're down on your luck, you've got nothing else, you may not have a choice. Same thing with pawn shops and all of that. Again, I'm not questioning the people necessarily necessarily, um, but the businesses are designed to take advantage of people that are down on their luck. So one of Solomon's top things, do not rob the poor because he is poor. See, the attitude from people that have stuff is that the people that don't have stuff can't do anything about it, so they take advantage of them. And sadly, that's pretty much universally true. It's a general truth. But it, I would say that one in my experience has been pretty true. I mean, think about it. Rich people can afford lawyers and send notes to people. When I, when I owned my own martial arts studio, I've taught for over 20 years, coming up on 25 years. Um, but when I owned my own studio, um, you know, if anything happened, I was done. I, I couldn't afford anything. Rich person threatens with a lawyer. Now you got problems if you don't have a lot of money. Um, so do not rob the poor because he is poor or crush the afflicted at the gate. And remember, the gate is the cultural center. It's kind of the marketplace. The modern version would be like your Facebook, Instagram, etc. It's where everybody met and congregated. Now it's more digital than physical, but it would have been the gates of the city at that point. So it's also talking about crushing and afflicting and humiliating. All right. Verse 23. For the Lord will plead their case. See? If, if, if you're abusing people that are poor, you're going to have to deal with God. And it may not seem like God does that much sometimes to defend the poor. But trust me, you don't want to be on God's bad side. You will get yours. Uh, all right. So, for the Lord will plead their case and take the life of those who rob them. Now, we don't always get to see that because this could mean spiritual life. It could mean something physically. It could be a very literal, they're going to die, 
right? Obviously, every time a rich person takes advantage of a poor person, they don't drop dead. Um, I, 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 part of me would say I wish that they would, but then I would deserve the same punishment for the areas that I sin. So let me not be arrogant and let that be a good lesson in your devotional life, uh, not to be arrogant because if you're wishing judgment on other people, you would have to be held to that same standard. And thankfully, God is gracious and merciful and doesn't just wipe us off the face of the earth when we sin. Um, but anyway, the Lord will plead their case and take the life of the one who robbed uh, of those who robbed them. Verse twenty four. Do not associate with a man given to anger. All right. So now we've talked about not taking advantage of the poor. Now we're going to move on to anger. So charity, and now anger. Do not associate with a man given to anger, or go with a hot tempered man. Why, Daddy? Or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You know what happens to hotheads. If you hang around them, you're going to end up becoming one. Don't do it, son. All right? Verse 26. So we talked about charity and, and, and really just caring about the lowest of the low, so to speak. And then we talked about anger. Now we're talking about debt and pledging for other people. Do not be among those who give pledges. Or sorry, do not be among those who give pledges, among those who become guarantors for debts. And that's talking about your personal debt as well as specifically the guarantor, the debt of others is, I, I think, strongly implied here, if not the explicit meaning. Um, and it's covered elsewhere in the Proverbs. So the, the general principle is that you're to live debt-free. Why? If you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take your bed from under you? See, the reason you don't want to get in debt isn't that borrowing in and of itself is wrong. It's that if you come to, or if you're really in debt when you come to the point that you can't pay that debt back, what do you have to give to pay that debt? You may not have anything, and then you're on the hook, and even what little bit you have will be taken away. Now, America has put some safeguards in place to keep that from being too terrible, but I've lived with nothing before, and it ain't fun. And it, when you're in debt, and you have nothing, and you owe something, and you have nothing, life is not good, even in America. Um, political stuff aside, I'm not going there um, in this video. That's not the purpose of this ministry. Um, but in this time, they had debtor's prison, in fact. So if you didn't have anything to repay, you would actually be a slave, an indentured servant, for a while to pay off that debt. Um, so verse 27, if you have, why? Because if you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take your bed from under you? And now we're going to move on to just general integrity. Verse 28, do not move the ancient boundary which your fathers have set. See, Land ownership was key then, and it's key now. Do not move the ancient boundary which your fathers have set. See, integrity, doing the right thing no matter what, even if no one's looking. That's what I teach my karate students, right? Well, moving the boundary, you see, they didn't really have surveyors the way that we do now back then, but even in the modern day, surveyors use landmarks typically. Now in the super modern day, they're starting to use GPS, but GPS is only so, so accurate, right? So the idea here is it would be easy, especially back then, it would be very easy to move a stone or some other landmark. Now if it's a big tree, that may not be easy to move, but if it's a stone or some other landmark that's the dividing line between property, it would be very easy to move that in the middle of the night one night and slowly gain yourself more land. That's not operating with integrity. So in verse 28, I don't think he's just talking because I believe that this is Solomon summarizing kind of his top hit list for his son. I don't think he's just talking about um, integrity with boundaries here with land ownership. I think he's using this as an example of having integrity in all your dealings and especially business dealings. It's my opinion. Um, I, I want to be honest with you about that. Um, but that's, that's my take on this section. And then verse 9, the reward for work. 
So this is the next category that I think Solomon is using to remind his son. So the reward for work. Do you see a man skilled in his work? So this would be the example of somebody that is a true craftsman. Like I always think about woodworking. I don't know why that's always my first thing, but I think about woodworking. Somebody that is really, really gifted in woodworking. Now, just like everything, you have to be discovered before you can reap the benefits. But let me, let me finish reading this and then I'll come back. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. In other words, just Joe Blow, right? So what's going on here is saying, look, your work will speak for itself. Do the absolute best that you can and your work will speak for itself and that will elevate you in life. And the example that he's using here is a skilled laborer. The example that my mind comes up with is a really talented woodworker. When you see somebody that just really knows how to make beautiful wood, like I think about like somebody that restores old Victorian homes and they have all the ornate woodwork and just the amazing skill that it takes to recreate that and the skill that it took for the people to create that to begin with is just mind-blowing, right? Their work speaks for itself. See, I've lived in poor areas and I've lived in rich areas of the country and I lived in an area that's pretty affluent when I had my karate studio. It's a very affluent area or affluent if you want to put it in the, uh, the way that it's said here. Um, but in that area, if somebody was really good at something, it, it made the circles, right? The, the ladies typically in that area were the ones that were in charge of decorating the home and that kind of stuff. So, and I think that's generically the case in, in, in general. But anyway, um, but somebody that was a real craftsman and could really do good work, like let's just even dial it down. Let's say somebody that's just a really good deck builder, right? they end up being elevated because richer and richer people want them to do the work because they know they're going to do a quality job. So eventually they end up working for the elite instead of Joe Blow. So maybe at one point they would have gone to a single story, 1,500 uh, square foot home, and that's kind of a small average home in America today. I think the actual average American home is 2,400 square feet. I don't know where they get those numbers, but that's supposedly the average home in America now. Uh, or I think new home, average new home. Uh, but anyway, Right, so let's let's just go with average, right? Let's say he started building decks for somebody that lives in a, in a 2,400 square foot home. Well, somebody that does super quality work, eventually they're gonna end up working in multi-million dollar homes and they're not gonna have time to work for the peons uh, down in average and below average income. That's what he's getting at here. He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. So he's telling his son, do your best. Use the example of a skilled laborer to help this make sense. But you do the absolute best, highest quality work that you can, and your work will speak for itself, and that will elevate you in life. So I think, again, that this section is Solomon. He's getting a little frustrated, kind of wanting to summarize for his son. Maybe he's not paying as much attention. I don't know. Um, but I think this is kind of Solomon's little hit list here, and that's how I'm interpreting this particular section of Proverbs. All right, guys, that's it for today. So as always, if you appreciate this ministry and this content, make sure and hit that like button, hit subscribe, turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. We'd love to have you as part of our family. Also, if you want to support this ministry, the two best ways to do that, number one is sharing this video. Help us gain new subscribers. Send it to somebody that you know that loves this type of content, or maybe that would just be curious to know. Maybe they're not even a Christian, but they're curious. Send some of these videos to them, and that way they can understand what a Christian thinks or what a Christian should understand from Scripture. Um, but we really want to make sure that we're growing the kingdom, and that's just a way that we can measure the influence of the ministry. So please help us in that way. And then of course, if you want to help financially, there are needs. So there is a link down in the description. The greatest need, honestly, is just for a number of people to do a small donation. If you want to give something larger, great. But even just a handful of people doing a small amount adds up and really helps us do more ministry. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thank you very much and God bless.